It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that the majority of people see cars as contraptions that run mostly on internal combustion. Whatever the engine, whether it runs on an Atkinson, Miller, Otto or Wankel cycle, the underlying principle is the same as that of a very happy wedding night. Suck, squeeze, bang, blow and a lot of hot pumping action. But what if this wasn't so? What if some other manner of making passenger cars move forward had taken hold of the automotive world? In this video, we examine five principles of propulsion that try to knock petrol off its perch. The steam engine. Steam is not something you usually associate with cars at all, but rather those old-timey trains of yesteryear that go choo-choo and look like Thomas the Tank Engine, etc. The principle is simple. You burn some sort of fuel, most famously coal, which then heats water that turns into steam. And just like my wife says when she puts up with me, that steam creates pressure that builds up and needs release. That released pressurized steam moves a piston back and forth and hey presto, motion. It's hard to imagine today the stranglehold that steam held on people's minds at the turn of the 20th century. Steam had been the basis for the Industrial Revolution. Steam made trains haul countless tons of cargo across continents. Steam powered ships around the world. Steam was good. Steam was the backbone of progress. So when the horseless carriage came along, no one understood why this great new mode of individualized transport should run on this weird petrol stuff, instead of using good old reliable cold water and fire. As such, steam-powered cars were popular during the early days of the automobile, with both electric and steam cars briefly outselling petrol cars in the US for a while in the early 1900s. The main reason was that it didn't have to start using a hand crank, which, at the time, was just like visiting a sketchy brothel. It could be very risky. What might surprise you is that steam cars were actually produced and sold to the public right up until after the Ford Model T had ended production, and some even tried to revive the steam car in the 50s and the 70s as a way of reducing pollution. So why did steam cars fail? For the same reason that steam trains failed. They were extremely thermally inefficient, required heavy components such as a boiler and a condenser, and just couldn't compete with its gasoline and diesel-powered counterparts. The gas turbine engine. It's basically what happens when you look at a jet engine and think, you know what this needs? Fewer moving parts and more fire. First, air gets sucked in at the front. Then it's squeezed by a compressor until it's so dense, it starts to vote for right-wing populists. Just as in a diesel engine, the compressed air heats. You add fuel and... The resulting hot air expands and rushes out the back through the turbine, which in turn spins the compressor at the front, so the whole thing keeps itself going. It's like a dog chasing its tail, except the dog's on fire and the tail is producing thrust. The big advantage of a turbine engine is that it will run on anything flammable. Petrol, diesel, kerosene, alcohol. Basically, it's like a Russian sailor. If it burns, it's down the hatch. World War II was the golden age of terrible ideas that turned out to be brilliant later. We got atomic energy, computers, rockets, radar, and of course, the jet engine. So once the Austrian painter and his mates were either dead or locked up, the world thought, okay, what if we use all this clever technology for moving about instead of turning our enemies into mush? So they slapped jet engines onto everything. Planes, trains, boats, and of course, cars. Around the time that the de Havilland Comet took to the skies as the first commercial jet, companies the world over tried their hand at a jet-powered or turbine-engined car. In the UK, Rover came up with the Jet One. Two seats, 150 miles an hour, and absolutely no chance of surviving a crash. France had this lovely looking thing, the Sosema Grégoire, which I've definitely mispronounced. Italy saw all of this and said, Aia canna make a tua, and created the Fiat Turbine concept. 
And the Americans? Well, they went mental. General Motors made a series of cars from 1953 onwards called the Firebird 1, 2, 3 and 4, which brought together the Jet Age and the Space Age, or could we say, the Jace Age. Just like that joke, the Firebird concepts went nowhere. And then there was Chrysler, the only company mad enough to actually put a turbine engine car in an average driver's hands on public roads. Its name was probably dreamt up while the entire Chrysler marketing department was having a week off because they ended up calling it the Chrysler Turbine Car. 50 were released into the wild between 1963 and 1966, and the motorists who bought one praised how it felt like the opposite of married life, smooth and low maintenance. But turbine-powered cars failed, obviously, otherwise we'd see them around today. Why? Because they had a starting procedure as complicated as a NASA launch, the acceleration of an ocean liner, and fuel economy that made oil barons weep with joy. And of course, there was the noise. It must have been like driving around with a vacuum cleaner constantly droning under the bonnet. In 2010, Jaguar tried to revive the gas turbine in the CX-75 concept car. The car was powered by electric motors, with the electricity being generated by diesel-fed microgas turbines and was supposed to have been manufactured as a 250 units limited production run. But just like my dreams of prosperity in my early 30s, this never came to be due to the Great Recession. But it did go out with a bang, having a role as Dave Bautista's baddie mobile in the 2015 James Bond film Spectre. Though, how a henchman got his hands on a concept car with an unproven powertrain to chase a British spy through the streets of Rome is beyond me. What if there was a car that was emission-free like an electric car, but didn't have to have a big heavy battery and dangerous high voltage cables and long charging times? or without the chemicals and flammableness of petrol, or the stink and roughness of diesel. Just like your wife telling you you're right, it sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? Well, there was the compressed air car. It's a vehicle powered by the same things politicians are full of, air, stored under high pressure in a tank and is then channeled to drive the wheels. Even though this technology is as obscure as a struggling indie band, it's been around for quite a while and once received attention from some big players before fading from the limelight. As far back as 1996, a French engineer called Guy Negre converted a Citroën AX to run on compressed air. Fast forward a few years and Tata Motors of India announced they would be investing in the development of a compressed air powered car. Peugeot Citroën, before the dark days of Stellantis, went a step further, actually presenting a prototype. A Citroën C3 II called the Hybrid Air was shown at the 2013 Geneva Motor Show, and it had a big compressed air tank running down the middle of the car, and that was allied to an 82 horsepower 1.2 VTI petrol engine. But this technology quietly and very thoroughly disappeared, just like flared trousers did once the 1970s were over. Why? There were various reasons, such as disappointing range, the general efficiency of it, and the need for investment in refilling stations. Additionally, there was also talk of the whole underlying principle behind the compressed air-driven car being a hoax, which leads me neatly onto the next entry. A car that runs on flow battery technology is an electric car that gets its power from two liquids in its tank. One is positively charged, one is negatively charged. You put them together to get current to run the car, etc. To refuel, you can either replace the fluids or recharge the liquids. Now, there's been really only one company that's pushed this type of automotive solution, and I'm going to talk about it here, although in all honesty, it deserves a video of its own. This company is called Nano Flow Cell, registered in the tax haven that is Liechtenstein. 
It was founded in 2013 by a colourful figure called Nuncio La Vecchia, whose hair makes him look like a European knockoff of Silvio from The Sopranos. In a glowing biography originally published on Nanoflo Cell's own website, it says La Vecchia was born in Switzerland in 1965 and... Alongside his intensive research activities, the physicist and autodidact is also a musician, with two successful albums to his name. In what little free time remains to him, he is a pilot and a racing driver. Even before founding Nanoflow Cell, La Vecchia had tried his hand at cars, being present at the 2009 Geneva Motor Show with a concept car called the NLV Quant. This was purported to be a revolutionary solar-powered sports car, developed in partnership with none other than Koenigsegg, the Swedish supercar manufacturer. Koenigsegg was so confident in the project that it dropped La Vecchia like a hot turd as soon as contractually possible, because investors doubted its feasibility, with one even taking legal action. After Nanoflow Cell became a thing, they launched a concept car called the Quant in 2014, which was supposed to be powered by salt water. They launched another called the Quantino in 2016 and boasted of the technology's range and efficiency. La Vecchia hasn't actually allowed anyone to inspect the gubbins of the car, claiming someone might steal his ideas, which certainly raises some flags of the crimson kind. If this were in any way true, I think old Nuncio should send someone to fill out the necessary paperwork at the patent office pronto. So this should answer the question as to why this technology hasn't taken off, so to speak. Here we are, over a decade after the first prototype and still nothing has been released to the public. Nanoflow Cell is still going, with its website showing a brand new 2024 version of its original concept, the Quant, as well as an additional vehicle, an off-roader called the Quant Up, and also a Flow Cell powered oversized drone designed to carry people, which doesn't seem to be real but just computer generated. They also show some salt water watches, with so much bling even Donald Trump would find them tacky but no info as to prices or how to actually acquire one. In sum, they've had years and years of development and thousands and thousands of miles of testing under their belt, a host of concept cars, an off-roader, aircraft and watches, and yet not a single thing has been sold. So what's happened to all that investment money? Maybe Lavecchia spent it all on that hair of his, or his budding singing career, I don't know. But if I were an investor, I'd be asking questions. You knew this was coming, right? Even if your interest in cars is small, which I somewhat doubt, otherwise you wouldn't be watching this, there's a good chance you've heard how when it comes to what runs our cars, hydrogen is the future. Now, if it is the future, I'd like to know when this future is happening, because hydrogen has been touted as a serious contender to replace fossil fuel for the last half fricking century. That's a lot of time for the future to have happened. Another notable instance of hydrogen as the harbinger of post-petrol motoring was the Top Gear episode where Clarkson, Hammond and May all droned on about how shit EVs were and how brilliant hydrogen is. That Top Gear episode aired in 2008. That was so long ago that Gordon Brown was still Prime Minister in the UK, mobile phones still had buttons and my hair was dark. Since then, EVs have exploded. And I see, oh, let me check, zero fuck hydrogen cars anywhere. The principle behind hydrogen is the same as that flow cell thing I mentioned earlier. It's a tank full of liquid, you do things to it, and electricity happens. Hydrogen cars really are nothing more than electric cars, but with extra steps to get the electricity. It failed because of two things. First, even though hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe, it tends to be stuck to other things, otherwise it would float off into space. The process to get hydrogen is energy intense, requiring storage under high pressure. It needs infrastructure to be built, etc. Again, it's the flow cell thing, but more explodey. Second is the fuel cell, 
which no automaker has managed to crack in terms of how much it costs to produce. It's like a big fat ostentatious wedding. Both need lots of money, they both use up precious metals, all for an underwhelming result. Still, there are manufacturers still trying to push hydrogen. For example, Honda, first with a catchy named FCX Clarity, and now the even catchier named CRV E colon FCEV. Also, Toyota with the Mirai and Hyundai with the Nexo. However, despite this, hydrogen hasn't exactly caught on, with these three being the only hydrogen fuel cell cars on sale today and only available in a handful of markets. The one that sells the most is the Hyundai Nexo, with 37,000 units shifted in the seven years it's been on sale. 37,000. For comparison, Hyundai has sold 300,000 electric Konas in that time. And for further comparison, Tesla sells that many Model Ys in under two weeks. So yeah, despite hydrogen being constantly hyped up as the future of motoring, the world has actually looked at that future and said, F*** no. So there you have it, five modes of making cars move that never made it into the mainstream. Did I miss anything? If so, let me know in the comments below. Please like, please share, please comment, please subscribe. And thanks very much for watching.